Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Know How is brought to you by IT Pro TV, flexible and entertaining training for your IT career. Visit itpro.tv slash knowhow and use the code knowhow30 to get a free seven day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Ring, Ring's alarm security kit is a smarter way to protect your entire home. Go to ring.com slash knowhow to learn how you can get whole home security for only $10 per month. Today on Know How, flows fragmentation frustration. Welcome to Know How. This is the show where we talk about IoT. Internet of all the things. With I-O-N, Florence Ion, that's me. <laughs> yes. I have no I-O-T I'm sorry. Name. It's just, just yeah. I've been making puns out of my name my entire life. That's so good. I just kind of lean into it. Yeah. I'm, M-M. Yeah. I'm Megan Maroney. Sometimes people call me Megan Moron for I don't know why. It's mean. <laughs> I call you M-M. M&M. Yeah. It's good. Uh, and yeah, today we're going to talk about Flo's fragmentation. Not actually just mine, but we want to do triple alliteration. Mm -hmm. But Megan and I, we talk a lot about the different ecosystems on the show, and we talk a lot about the things that make us really frustrated about these ecosystems. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. And we have a guest. (gasps) Not just one guest. We have two guests. We have two guests. Yes, yes, we do. All right, so we are here with Mike Susi from Google. Uh, <laughs> Senior Product Marketing Manager. Sorry, Mike, I wanted to make sure that I got your last name right there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, uh, follow your show, really exciting stuff you talk about, so I'm very happy to Yay, okay, well, if you've been following us, then you know all season long, Meg and I have been talking about all the different ecosystems that we live with in our house and kind of the way that all these different things work with one another. And so we really wanted to talk to you about the Nest trajectory in particular, especially because we've got Google Thread running through that. And I think some of our audience members might be wondering what is the difference between that Google Thread? How does it how does it keep everything interlaced in the Nest ecosystem? And I personally would like to know, you know, why you guys chose this particular standard. So I guess, want to kick it off? Want to kick off some questions? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think that, uh, the one thing to, to kind of note, right, is that Google acquired Nest back in 2014. For the last four years, we've been running independently. Well, and and essentially, uh, Google was a sister company where we'd collaborate. Back in February of 2018, we actually merged Nest into the Google Home division. So we're actually in that process of merging, realizing that between Google products um, and voice assistant, along with Nest products, really addressing energy, safety, and security, that really we had a, an incredible portfolio of products that we, we could we could work for integration of our products, let alone really working with outside third-party uh, products and ecosystems and bring them in to really deliver unparalleled experiences at the end of the day for the consumers. Right, so you have talked a lot about how uh, a smart home can't truly be smart unless all those things are talking to each other. So I wanted to get a little more from you on Google Thread. Um, I read a little bit about, about it being related to the Qualcomm spec, correct me if I'm wrong there, um, and I was just wondering if you could just explain that that spec a little bit, kind of where it came from and how it relates to the Zigbee and Z-Wave specs that exist. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think it's important to understand that like Zigbee and Z-Wave have been protocols um, around the industry for over like literally the last 10 or 15 years. And a lot of the, the, the protocols, those protocols have been run on big servers, you know, so each one kind of takes a different shape to solve different problems. And if you kind of look inside, you'll find are based on you know CPU, RAM, and power. And so a lot of those protocols were really weren't addressed um, for the nuances of today's connected home, which are really much smaller chips. That's one of the constraints that I think the existing protocols um, and paradigms have been challenged with. We looked at the existing protocol from Zigbee, Z-Wave, Insteon, 933, and realized that 
the protocols out there weren't really addressing the issues uh, that were important for us. And those are really centered around three or four different things. Number one is security. So knowing, you know, Google and Nest have to take security as a number one priority. Um, security was, was kind of the top of the list. Um, the second thing is uh, the ability to easily join a network. So device provisioning, getting it onboarded uh, is, is another criteria. Uh, a third one is power constraints. So how can we, how can we reduce the uh, communication that would endure quickly, right? So, um, and then, you know, lastly is uh, really making sure again on, on, uh, that it works with a v wide variety of products. So we support the thread um, and the protocol supports over 250 devices in the home. So, you know, four or five years ago when we were looking at that, we looked at all of the, all the protocols and realized there wasn't anything out there. So, you know, Nest was a founding member and then that became uh, something that is a nonprofit organization that is, is, is an open protocol, but we use it specifically on our own products as well today. Um, and, uh, and I think there's over 200 um, companies that have joined the Thread Group. And, you know, it's really taken off, actually, as a very secure protocol um, that is very efficient and, um, you know, long-lasting battery. Uh, so Apple recently joined the Thread Group. What did you make of that? Um, I thought that was great. It's uh, it's a validation of the technology. Again, this is going on four years. Um, Thread.org is an open source, you know, Thread community. And to me, to have such another big player join Thread Group, um, you know, validates the technology. And at the end of the day, you know, there's other companies that have, have done that, Samsung and Smart Things, uh, um, and the old CEO of, of Smart Things really praised uh, what we were doing with Thread and that there was a need in the industry. So to me, the announcement with Apple is a positive thing for for both Thread and the industry as a whole. So I know you were at Nest before they were bought by Google. Um, was there some concern um, when you were acquired of um, this fragmentation problem, like being uh, owned by one of the big players? From a Nest perspective? Mm -hmm. I don't think there was a concern. There's deep respect for Google and the brand, right? And mm -hmm. you know, if you kind of look at Google's um, background in search and you know, a de developer platform, you know, and it, they've only been in the, in the hardware space outside of the phone space uh, for the last two years. So when you start talking about Google Home products with Google Voice and, um, you know, the speakers and different things like that, it's only been a couple of years. And so what Nest was able to bring to Google was really a hardware discipline. Um, you know, Tony Fidel and Matt Rogers really came out of building incredible hardware that is beautiful, that consumers want to put on their walls. And, you know, merging that with uh, Google software platform and, um, and and really working collaboratively, I think it's it's kind of a great marriage. Um, and really, this is just the beginning. And I think, again, er earlier, as I kind of painted the, the different categories in the home that both Nest products and Google uh, products offer, and then adding software on top of that, let alone we're, we're at the tip of the iceberg of really leaning into kind of AI, uh, machine learning, habitual pattern recognition, natural language, all of these things to really create a really kind of unparalleled different experience for the consumer. So it's really about coming together with our strengths of hardware, software, and kind of this AI a bit to really bring on new experiences that the consumer were, uh, will just enjoy where the technology hopefully fades into the back and yet your home truly automates around the comings and goings of the family, if you will. So what do the Nest devices need to kind of work interchangeably with other devices in terms of the spec that we were sort of talking about earlier? Yeah, so um, all of Nest products uh, essentially have three different communication protocols. Uh, Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. um, which is the ability to talk to the cloud. Um, there's Thread and Weave for device-to-device -device communication. And then we also use Bluetooth, um, mostly for provisioning and getting a new product onboarded. Um, sometimes we use NFC in certain cases, but those are our primary uh, three protocols. Um, we also have the Works with Nest ecosystem. Right. Um, there's a, over 40,000 developers in that in the ecosystem that have signed up for Works with Nest, from garage startups to Fortune 100 companies, and we've done you know pretty incredible uh, partnerships uh, with with these companies. Uh, most of those integrations use a cloud to cloud um, integration. Mm -hmm. So you know, a third party would have their own device that talks to the cloud. Their, their cloud talks to ours, and ours uh, down to our devices, and vice versa. 
Um, and that's a majority of the integration. Um, last year, we did a collaborative uh, product build with Yale Locks, yep. uh, where we did the Nest Yale Lock. That was the first third part product uh, that we actually enabled to have the Weave technology in there. So uh, the Yale Lock actually speaks uh, Thread and Weave directly to our products and infrastructure, um, which eliminates the, the need to hop to the cloud, essentially. So, you know, that's the beginning of, I think, many partnerships to come. Um, you know, and, and while we essentially serve six different kind of categories across Nest and Google products, the, 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 the home is vast and there's probably about 15 to 25 major categories. And we don't plan on trying to solve for every category in the home. What, what we've done is really kind of chosen our verticals and our disciplines. And then we're partnering with those other third party device manufacturers at different levels, you know, whether it's a Nest a law collaborative effort or all the way down to a cloud to cloud integration. and or just a third party um, you know, manufacturer that wants to join the program, it's free, and then they ask for a client review, we do a certification, next thing you know, they're part of our ecosystem. So um, it's really, it's, it's quite broad. So I wanted to actually, ask about yeah. that certification actually, because I've spent the last year basically looking through every DIY security system there is out there. And um, I noticed a lot of them integrate with Nest in addition to the individual Nest Secure that exists. Um, mm -hmm. So what is, does a third party need to be able to work harmoniously within the Nest ecosystem? Um, they really need uh, cloud to cloud. So they have to have a cloud infrastructure. Um, and then it works with Nest. Uh, you, you essentially sign up for the program. You get access to individual device APIs. Uh, so the developer can download those. And we expose different controls of our products to those developers. So um, many of the developers tap into our home and away assist mm -hmm. uh, feature. So it started w way back with the Nest thermostat. When you install it, we understood when you were home or away. And there's so many meaningful actions that we can take on behalf of the consumer when we know whether you're occupying the home or whether you're away. And so, so many, uh, many, many manufacturers you know, do integrations, whether it's to reduce energy and cost savings by turning off lights, or let's say um, we've done integrations, actually, if you forget to close your garage door. So we have an integration with Chamberlain Garage Door right. Opener. If, if it senses that you're away from home, it'll give you an alert saying, you know, you may want to check to see um, if your uh, garage door is open or closed and you can close it remotely. Um, we also use deterrent. So one of the things we, we do is, um, uh, if if uh, if one of our cameras, outdoor cameras, uh, spots a person, because we have person detection essentially, uh, a third party can tap into into our APIs and be able to turn on a light. So if you're away on vacation, you know Nest Cam outdoor spots a person, uh, they're walking up into your yard. You know we can actually do a deterrent and turn on the light just based on that. Uh, we also have just home and away assist that if you're gone for over 24 hours. We'll randomly turn on lights to simulate uh, what we call occupancy, right? It's just mocking that you're actually home. So pretty kind of cool, you know, integrations and, and user benefits that we that we allow developers to to do based on our our ecosystem and APIs. I love the word occupancy. It's <laughs> a great <laughs> word. Um, so I, I have an SCAM IQ outdoor uh, Nest Cam, as we talked about before, and it does have the feature, and you know, it it, know, it recognizes when my kids come in. You know, when I first set it up, it said you know unrecognized face, and then I could say yes, it, um, it yes that person is allowed in, and no that person isn't. So what what where what happens to those photos? Um, I, I noticed. I was almost thinking, well, you know, it's a Google-owned company. It's probably going to start bringing up my photos because it knows all my kids, including, you know, their faces and can tell apart my identical twins when um, my friends and family can't. What, what happens to those photos? Um, what, uh, what can you tell us about privacy of those photos? And, and uh, yeah, what, what, what can you tell us about that? Right now, they're just stored in isolation. Um, and again, Nest, uh, for all intents and purposes, were, has been run as a separate company. Um, and right. we do, you know, had a policy of not sharing any of that data. Of course, during the merger, we're becoming one company. So we're actually working through kind of all the privacy policies as it relates and being transparent back to the consumer of how your, your, your Nest photos of the past or not just photos, but kind of security will be transitioned into, into the merged company. So that's kind of coming forward. Um, but you know, I think we've brainstormed out a lot of what we can do 
uh, by analyzing photos, not uh, personally, not by having people look at them, but having algorithms, again, look for patterns is really the key. Um, when we really talk about the future of the connected home, we, uh, and, and by the way, we tend not to like to use smart home. Uh, that tends to infer that you're controlling it with your, with your smartphone. Mm. And I think what we're really moving towards is the thoughtful home experience, one that cares about you, your family, the people inside it as an invited guest, allowing us to automate on your behalf thoughtfully. And so we want to kind of be able to do that. But in order to do that, we need data. So it's really um, a social contract. It's an invitation. Um, consumers can choose to share data with us or not. If they do, we're hoping to provide really the convenience of the benefit of being able to do a level of automation that's really going to be unparalleled. So um, we don't have anything to announce yet, but you can just kind of see that um, the more data we get, the better. But there are security privacy concerns. We are have a policy of being very transparent about what we collect, what we do with it, and then always, always enable the consumer to turn it off at any given time. And so it's just, um, you know, that, that that's how we look at data, how, how, we, how we are kind of looking towards, you know, the future of what we can provide for the consumer. So I, I bet when you tell people what you do in your regular life, they um, probably ask you all about the connected home, which I do prefer the connected yeah. home to the smart home. Uh, what do you tell people like when they're just like, I want my home to be connected, but I don't know where to start? What do you usually tell mm -hmm. people? You know, that's a really good question. And I, my question back to them is, what's your pain point? And, you know, uh, usually, again, there's categories. So is it about saving energy or reducing your heating bill? If that's the case, start with the thermostat. If it's um, entertainment, a, a Chromecast is, is, is a great place to start. A voice assistant is actually uh, also a great entry point. You know, with the Google Mini, you can get in for under $50 and you have the beginning of using voice, not just for search, but that can be something that can be expanded upon. There's actually a survey um, uh, or, or there's a study out there, a retail study, a 45% of Google Home queries are to control uh, devices in the home. Mm. So consumers essentially want to use their voice for, for home automation to turn on lights, to turn it off, to set the thermostat. It's just another interface that's just as easy as either walking up to a light switch, um, but it's much easier when you're in bed, right, to just say turn off the lights or, you know, uh, turn up the heat. So uh, voice is, is, a, is a great place to start. But really, at the end of the day, it's around solving a particular pain point that a consumer has. And you can look at safety, where Nest Secure is a great um, safety and security, uh, Nest Secure um, or our Nest Protect. Um, if it's around entertainment, again, Google Chromecast. If it's about Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi and reliability is huge. Um, and... Google Wi-Fi is a great solution because it now introduces Wi-Fi mesh um, to really uh, cover all the all the nooks and crannies of the home to be sure that you have good Wi-Fi. And that's really important when you do talk about connected devices to be sure that they're always online and, that, and they're not dropping off and, they're, and you don't have that latency issue. Um, so from my perspective, it's always about if we can provide the consumer with a great entry experience around a pain point that they're having. For instance, Nest Hello is our is our doorbell camera. Um, and if you pair that with a Google Mini, uh, which is our voice assistant, when somebody rings the doorbell, it, it does what we call visitor announce. Someone's out so the actually, door. <laughs> exactly. Your mom and, is out the door. <laughs> well, and it'll tell you who if you have that yes. feature turned on, right? And, you know, so if you have a Chromecast, you can then say, you know, uh, Chromecast, show me the door. And it'll actually, if you're watching TV, you'll be able to see who's at the door. So the you can begin to see how... All these products are going to start working together at, at such a degree. I always kind of look at it this as an evolutionary. The last three or four years about individual product discovery, you know, using your smartphone to control things. Now we're moving into cross-product integration where they're going to work better together uh, and then starting to use voice as another interface and then the seamless experience around most solutions. Um, not the entire whole home, but whether you're talking about doorman, security, safety, entertainment, there's kind of like two or three or four products working in and that solution category really, you know, it provides a great experience to build on. So I actually have um, 
I, I mean, I pretty much have the whole nest ecosystem, <laughs> I should just say it, uh, <laughs> embedded throughout my house, um, both mix of personal and professional reasons. But so I've been able to experience kind of this whole like e ecosystem, the way it's supposed to work. And when yeah. people come over, they are really into it. But the one thing they ask me is how much does this all cost? And I think the big one of the big barriers for some people out there, in particular with the connected home, is that sort of that that annual monthly upkeep. Um, is there any you know any talks around the nest buildings about possibly you know maybe like a free tier that offers one you know one person who has identifiable through the security cameras or or something of the sort to sort of um, to help newcomers feel like that's something that is available to them. Yeah, I, mean, um, I think there's a couple things to note. Um, it's funny that we're talking about pricing because I am at the Cedia trade show, mm -hmm. which is in San Diego right now. And this is a custom installer trade show. This has been an industry for the last 30 years where they do essentially ten to $100,000 installs of home entertainment and security mm -hmm. and connected home installations. And um, in some respects, this has come so affordable but I do understand for us to really hit mainstream, that price is is a big issue. And we're really heading towards economies of scale here. So to your point, um, I think as technology grows, you get you know broader adoption, pricing is constantly being analyzed and uh, essentially looked at, um, both in creating less expensive products, as well as looking at services that could be essentially bundled um, at, a, at a less expensive price. So my overall thought is that you're gonna over the over the next, you know, tough to predict, but you know, over the next couple of years, certainly you're gonna start to see prices come down as more adoption occurs. So, just like any industry, uh, economies of scale will will start to play into this. But there are true hard costs if you think about it for companies like Google of having to stream video right. across a bandwidth and store it, and it, it's surprisingly more expensive than than people think. Um, but but I do understand that. Uh, you know, for us to reach mainstream adoption, we it, prices do need to come down. And and I I mean and I, I I don't like I love things that are free. Don't get me wrong, but it, <laughs> it is slightly comforting that I pay for the subscription right. that has the facial recognition. It's a it's a small comfort because you know, as tech people, we always question like, why is the service free? What are they doing? Mm -hmm. You know that sort of thing. So um, right. I appreciated your answer about the companies being separate, but it is also something that we should all keep in mind. Like you said, that there's a cost to these things. Right. <laughs> Is there any, so I, again, because I've got all these things in my house, I, I do have the nicely designed uh, motion sensors, for instance, the entry sensors, um, yeah. which doubles motion sensors as well, very nicely designed. Um, but I'm kind of, you know, part of the thing that is kind of a bummer is if I take out the Nest Secure for some reason, I have to install like the Nest, uh, what's it called, the Nest Connect, which has the spec in it. Is there maybe a future where we don't have to rely on these, these little median points that have to connect us all, maybe a future where just the chip isn't everything? <laughs> no, it's a really good point. Um, one of the philosophies that Nest has had from day one is that you shouldn't have to buy a hub, mm -hmm. another piece of hardware that just sits there and does interoperability between the different protocols and different devices that you've had. So even when we built uh, the Nest learning thermostat from day one, we actually overbuilt it. Uh, it has seven different sensors in it. It's got Wi-Fi. It's got an 802.15.4 chip in it that runs thread and weave. It's got a Bluetooth for onboard. I mean, it's it's actually overbuilt in many different ways. But to your point, when it when it does come to you know thread and and weave devices, currently the lock needs to have some sort of medium device in order to t uh, interop uh, and and convert that communication signal essentially to the cloud that can be controlled remotely. So um, I think you're going to find over time, we don't have anything to announce today, that all these little kinks, if you will, will be worked out to where it should be seamless. We, we still hold true to the philosophy that you shouldn't have have to have another piece of hardware just to act as that hub. And you know we, we believe that in the long term, we'll be able to solve for that. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Mike Susi is a senior product marketing 
manager at Google with, with Nest. Um, thanks for taking the time. I mean, I know you're at a conference, so we want to let you get back to that. Um, where's the best place for people to go if they like what you, they've heard from you and they want to learn more about all the stuff that you've talked about? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Um, again, follow the show. Real big fan here. So I appreciate uh, being a guest finally. So that's that's awesome. Um, as far as learning more about our products, nest.com, of course. And then uh, you can go to home.google.com and find out about all of our products and then stay tuned for more information as we join forces. Thank you so much, Mike, for also a little bit of teasing. Really appreciate that. <laughs> now we have lots of stuff to look forward to. I think it's going to be a really busy winter, I'm hearing. <laughs> so. Keep smiling. I all appreciate right. it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. We are going to talk to Stacey Higginbottom about all uh, the fra fragmentation, frustration, all the standards out there, uh, and whether the newest one uh, will be useful to us. But first, I want to thank the sponsor of Know How IT Pro TV. Now, if you are watching this right now, and obviously you are, maybe you're just listening, you like to be taught things about technology, and that is what IT Pro TV does. They're like us, but more technical and more designed for people who want to get jobs in this field. I don't know if you've read this recent survey, but there was a, a survey about how many companies will uh, hire you without a college degree, and many more, like uh, Google. Apple, um, they don't require college degrees anymore. They are looking for candidates who have hands-on experience through coding boot camps or industry-related training like IT Pro TV. So that is what they're looking for. From CompTIA and Cisco to EC Council and VMware, IT Pro TV has you covered with everything you need to launch or to grow your career. CompTIA recently named IT Pro TV as its official video training partner. They have over 4,000 hours of binge-worthy on-demand training. New content is added daily. Courses are conveniently listed by category, certification, and job role. Stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on demand worldwide. You can use your Chromecast, your Roku, your Amazon Fire TV, your Apple TV, your PC, or you can use their recently updated iOS and Android apps. If you manage a team, IT Pro TV offers flexible online training for IT teams of all sizes. Keep your team's skills up to date with interactive training that they will actually enjoy watching. They have engaging hosts presenting information in a talk show format. You'll have full control over your team's training schedule and you can track your team's results via IT Pro TV's Pro Portal. You can see metrics like logins, viewing time, courses viewed. You can see what tracks your employees have completed and more. Now, September 18th, I don't know if you knew this, but September 18th is National IT Professionals Day. I'm looking forward to it. I hope that uh, someone will make a cake for all the IT professionals in your life. Celebrate with an IT Pro TV subscription, even better than cake, and join the more than 100,000 IT Pro TV members today. All you have to do is visit itpro.tv slash knowhow to learn more about IT Pro TV's team solution and to request a free team trial. Or you can sign up for an individual monthly membership and you'll get a free seven-day trial at itpro.tv slash knowhow. Use the code knowhow30, and then you'll get 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your active subscription. Standard subscriptions are normally $570 a year, but you will pay only $399 when you go to itpro.tv slash knowhow and use the code knowhow30. Flexible training, binge-worthy content, life changing results and we thank IT Pro TV for supporting this episode of Know How. So one of the biggest hurdles as we've been discussing this episode, uh, the biggest hurdles for IoT is interoperability uh, or what Flo and I like to call Flo's fragmentation, frustration. Mine, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not just hers, it's everybody's, but she has a name that starts with F, so it's good. It uh, it's not just about what works or more often what doesn't work, but it's also about security. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to invite back friend of the show, Stacey Higginbottom, um, to, because she has reported about the new standard that's gonna change and everything, right, Stacey? Welcome back. <laughs> Or nothing, I don't know. <laughs> or nothing. <laughs> so tell us what uh, was announced this week with IOTivity.2.0. Yes. 
Sure. So the this was actually last week, uh, but IoT or the Open Connectivity Foundation, and I always call it the wrong acronym. So if I do that, I'm so sorry. But the Open Connectivity Foundation has been working on this standard for a really long time, like since 2015, and they announced version two. We thought this was going to be available actually way earlier, like right after CES, like mm-hmm. a few months after, but it it didn't. Um, the big things about this release, and I should say the goal of IOTivity is to get rid of all the hubs. It's so every device in your home has a set of properties associated with it. So a light bulb will be like, I'm a light bulb. I can turn on, I can turn off, I can dim, I have the following colors. And every single other device in the home that wants that information can just access it and be like, oh, if I need to, I can turn on this light bulb by talking to it in this way. Right now, that's not how things work. Right now, you have to call, like, for each individual type of light bulb, you, you have to call, like, different APIs, and you're like, yep. oh, I'm going to call Philips Hue and ask them to turn on these lights. I'm going to yep. call Lutron and ask it to turn on these lights. And that's a pain, and it makes life so hard for anybody building a product that wants to work with other products. So that's their goal. So we're not even really talking about my frustration, which is like I want my um, Echo Show to work with my Nest Cam. We're talking about from the people that are building these tools. Yes. Yes. This is the idea is that you could actually pick a device that was OF. Okay. See, I did it. OCF certified um, or IOTivity certified, and you'd be like, oh, this totally works with this other thing that also has this standard. But it's not actually how it's gonna work. Um, there's some basics there, but there are going to be different layers on top. So not everything is going to work. A good example would be something like your light bulb. May They may say like it works and it does. It'll turn on and off, but you can't use like cool color recipes or things like that. For that, you're going to have to go back to the apps and the APIs. So we're not getting rid of our hubs is what you're saying. Uh, it's <laughs> unlikely. And the other thing is, I'm not sure how many people want to use this. So they talked about LG, Hire, uh, Samsung, and one other company I can't recall right now, uh, deciding to put out products in 2019 that use this standard. I think we'll see them. I don't know if they're gonna extend that across the line, if we're gonna see a lot of other things. One of the problems with the standard was up until now, they um, really focused on big devices like gateways. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things like light bulbs or refrigerators, they don't have super memory. They don't have super processing power. So they're going to be using something called IOTivity Lite. And so that's not directly compatible in all ways with just normal IOTivity. Ah, it's already starting. I'm like, my blood is already starting to boil a little (laughs) bit. Um, I also was noticed in your write-up, by the way, uh, on your website, Stacy on IOT.com. Go visit it. And that's Stacy with an E, by the way, for those who are listening just to the audio, um, is the fact that a lot of these companies, it feels like we're just, we're being forced to be locked into a certain ecosystem. And it's like, well, why would we allow everybody to play nice? Because that would <laughs> add more competition. Hmm. That would totally destroy our revenue model, which yeah. is to get you to buy all of our stuff. Right. Right. I mean, it works for Apple. Sorry, Megan. <laughs> it does. It, I mean, that everyone has taken a page. They're like, well, Apple can do this in hardware. Yeah. Why can't we? You just have to tell everyone that you're more secure and don't ask too many questions. <laughs> don't. Yeah. I mean... It's a shame because there is so much promise in devices actually having interoperability. If you think about the things you could be able to do, like you could just tell Amazon, be like, hey, Madam A, could you set it up so when someone comes to my front door after dark, turn on the porch light? Mm -hmm. Like that's something that could theoretically be possible if everyone use the same standards because you'd only have to write these things once. But now you have to, it's no, it's not happening. 
And it may one day happen, but it's not you, happening now. You have to find a third party app. You have to, maybe if you're really experienced, you'll throw in some Android apps that let you do some special things in there, like a Tasker app to do some stuff, but it is not easy and like trying to trying to sell work on this stuff sometimes is hard too because there's no there's no exact standard for IoT so you can't just say go do A B and C and you can do D it's like would you like to do A would you like to do B would you like to do X <laughs> and if X happens would you like it to do A or B but only between the hours of this time and that time <sighs> and like the one and, and I've done this for a couple things, but being forced to think about all this, that is, no no normal person wants to do that. It's no. True. We are not normal people. Which is why, isn't that <laughs> yeah. why now they're building this stuff into like new houses so that people, like you're just walking into an ecosystem, you're buying a house and now you buy an ecosystem too. It's like, here you yeah, go. Yeah, that terrifies me. Yes. KB Homes today said that they were actually going to put Google yes. Assistant in their homes, um, which on one hand, you're like, yay, someone's going to help me do all this. And sure. on the other hand, you're like, I'm an Apple person. I don't want Google Home or yeah. I love Madam A. Mm -hmm. Aye. Aye. So you, in your piece, you kind of explain that the, the reason this happened is that when device makers of this, you know, connected home stuff started making the devices, they looked at the mobile industry and said, okay, well, it works. It works with Apple, like it works, you know, with Android. And uh, so why don't I make it work with the toothbrush and the light bulb and the lock and the coffee maker? But because, but it's not working that way. It's not, um, but they, they have high hopes of what you're seeing actually is things like um, Amazon's Echo, Adam A, and Google becoming standards in and of themselves. And what they are doing is they're, they're doing it via native support of, mm -hmm. or sorry, native skills in their digital assistants. So things like when you connect your thermostat to an Amazon Echo, for example, the Amazon Echo has a native skill that understands what a thermostat is. And now it has, you know, locks, it has video doorbells, it has ovens even. So we're seeing that happen in those two ecosystems. So you might one day be forced to choose between Amazon and Google here. So yay, that would be better than kind of what we have now. So, I mean, in, in, it's very true. Standards efforts don't really work out. I mean, there's Wi-Fi and maybe Bluetooth. I mean, I can't think of a lot of others. The rest are usually set by industries mm -hmm. and the winner gets to set them. And that's where we are right now. I thought the winner was like Zigbee <laughs> at this point in terms of... Zigbee is not as friendly as you might think. Like yeah, when I bring my true. Zigbee devices with the Echo Plus, which has Zigbee, yeah. not all of them work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you found that out when you yeah. got the Echo Plus. Mm -hmm. I warned you about that. It's, it's kind of... Yeah, Zigbee, Zigbee is actually a nightmare standard because they they try to be too many things to too many people and now you've got many versions of Zigbee. Yeah. And so what, I mean, yeah, that, and they're over-promising too, because the mm -hmm. promise, the whole promise of the Echo Plus was you can just say, you know, Madame May, find all my devices. And that has sure, not worked I'll do out. it for you. I'm your assistant. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, she'll find a couple of things as long as, and even she admits that some of it is not, um, y you know, it, you, well, well, if you have locks or if you have lights, you have to do it separately. And some of that, so some of that is a function of security, but some of it is a function of just crazy competing standards mm -hmm. or, I mean, Zigbee has Zigbee Lightlink. They had Zigbee Home Automation versions one, two, I think, maybe three. They had a special Zigbee for like power companies. I mean, it's, it's not great. <laughs> So the security is, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up because a standard would help improve security, correct? Maybe. I mean, the theory. <laughs> no, this is important. The I mean, I'm glad we're getting these live reactions. Cause <laughs> the theory is that, you know, if you had a standard that was open source and people could test against it and put things, then yes, you would... People would say, oh, hey, by the way, you guys, this is totally broken. We should fix this. Um, the thing with IoT, and actually IoTivity, one of the reasons the 2.0 standard was delayed is because 
they were working on the security aspects of it. And I will say that they did some stuff with public key encryption um, that is good, but they also only handle security at the device level. So they don't handle all the other aspects mm. of security associated with IoT devices. So they don't do what they recommend you encrypt your traffic from device to hub and then hub to cloud, but they don't enforce that. They recommend you don't like store your data on a unsecured Amazon instance, for example. But you know, they don't enforce that. So a standard is only gonna go so far when it comes to things like security because that's super complex, but it would help because it gives you, it gives everybody the same set of tools to work with and test against. So Stacy, like, is there any, is there any advice? I mean, what kind of advice should we be giving as the people who are telling people about these devices and these ecosystems? like? What should Megan and I, I mean, what's you, what's the advice you give people about this? Sure, this is, so I, you're like, what, why? <laughs> tell us what to um, tell people. Empower <laughs> us with information. I always ask people what they wanna do. Right now you cannot buy a smart home. You really just no. cannot. Um, so, and if you, if you have, you're just like, I just wanna test it out. Then I tell people to just test it out with lights mm -hmm. because it's pretty low risk, pretty high return. That's like but, it was my mom, by the way. Yeah. See? She loves it. Um, she loves having I, a different colored light. Like that just makes her happy. She can change it from blue to green like that. Mm -hmm. It's magic. Anyway. See? <laughs> no, no. And that's and that gets into all kinds of fun things because you could have her set up and if this and that mm -hmm. recipe for, or an applet, sorry, for like, hey, when the weather gets below freezing, turn blue. Yeah. And then she'll be like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we do stuff like that. Um, so, and with lights, I ask them usually, Hey, do you have a digital assistant? So are you already in on, you know, Madam A or Google or HomeKit? And I don't tend to recommend HomeKit because it's so much more expensive, all the devices are. But if someone's like, I am a diehard Apple person and I really want to stick with that, then I will. But otherwise, if they have nothing, I used to steer them towards Madam A, but now I'm actually steering them towards Google because I think the assistant is much better. Oh yeah. So, you know, then I'm like, hey, get a Google Mini, get a couple bulbs that work with it, you're done. Um, mm -hmm. If they have a different use case, then, you know, I, I help them try to solve their use case, but there's no like one size fits all. Yeah, and then Google is good too. I mean, Amazon and Google are share this, that like many people who use Apple and Android use both. Like many people who use Apple use Gmail or Google Photos or, you know, there's there's a lot of crossover there. So when I've used the Google Assistant, there are a lot of things that it can do for me, even though I'm, you know, 75% Apple. Mm-hmm. I'm yes. sorry, I'm just stuck in the Google land. <laughs> That's okay. I'm like, it's I love the for me. <laughs> It's it's great. And, you know, the nice thing is both of those have a much more open ecosystem and a better assistant than Apple does right now. Apple. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. yeah. So I guess we have to wait. <laughs> so the standard isn't what you're saying is a standard isn't necessarily the panacea to all of our problems. I, I think if it were executed properly and people actually bought into it, yes. But I don't think we're gonna see a lot of these products. And it's not like, I, I would look for this. When Apple or Google or Amazon sign up to participate with IOTivity, mm. then we can be like, oh, now it's getting good. Mm -hmm. Apple signed up with Thread. The th yeah, yeah, what are your thoughts on the Thread We, we actually like, just talked to Google about Google Thread, so. <laughs> So Thread is a wireless protocol. So it's like a layer underneath. This is IOTivity up here. It's more application layer. Mm -hmm. And Thread is down here at the wireless protocol right. layer. So yay. <laughs> <laughs> and Thread is actually built on the same. So you can do a couple things. What's interesting about Apple joining was that Thread originally was built on the same radio, like IEEE standard right. as Zigbee. 802, I always forget, 802.15.4, 802.15.4. Um, and so what happens is up until now, Bluetooth or Apple with HomeKit has only used Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So you could actually run thread over Bluetooth. And I've talked to people who are like, yeah, we could run thread over Wi-Fi if we wanted to. So it's either that Apple's gonna be more excited about Zigbee or Apple's just gonna be like, yeah, I'm gonna run 
thread over Bluetooth. So hmm. it would be cool if they opened up to Zigbee because there's a lot of sensors out there that you can't use right now with HomeKit because their Wi-Fi sucks batteries and Bluetooth is not super awesome yet as, as a mesh network. We are still at the beginning of this. I thought that we were at least in the middle of it. I was wrong. Mm -hmm. We are still at the beginning. <laughs> so beginning. And you know what? We're going to notice it. Like, we're going to have our iPhone moment, I think, when we can start talking yeah. to our devices, uh, like talking to our digital assistants and telling them what to do, and it just happens. I thought it would be when they, like, started proactively telling you about things, but I don't think that's anywhere near. No, because anything can tell you about anything. I mean, I can get a note if, I, I'm, that's the way I, I feel. Like you can just have a voice talk to you based on whatever notification you're already getting on your phone, for instance. That's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, that would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, well, have, it already tells me when there's someone things. at the door. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they are a little smarter. I mean, my Nest doorbell's like, oh, I saw your husband at the door, mm -hmm. or I saw, an unknown person. So, you know, that's getting a little bit better. Or UPS guy as I put him in there, but it reads it as up sky. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> it's the up sky. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only up you know. Anyway. Well, Stacy, thank you so much for taking the time to explain the inexplicable to us once <laughs> again. Um, Stacy on IoT, subscribe to her podcast, go to her website. She has a newsletter as well, which I also subscribe to. Great way to keep in touch with everything going on Stacy's website. Mm -hmm. And of yes. course, this week in Google. On yes, Wednesdays. here on Twit Network. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Have a thank great you, day. Thank you, Stacy. Hey. Bye. We have more IoT goodness on the way, but first I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Ring. You know, you've heard us talking about Ring. Uh, we talk about it all the time for a good reason, because they are a great doorbell camera and they've been around. My parents have a Ring and they love it. And I also love it because it just gives me a sense of security that they're okay because they have this device. It's also uh, keeps me from going in and stealing things from their house, which I would never do, of course, mom and dad. Let me tell you a little bit uh, about Ring. They've sort of reinvented the alarm system. Traditional alarm companies prioritize high monthly payments and they tie you into long-term contracts. And Ring doesn't do that. It's easy to install, it's affordable, and it's, there are no long-term contracts. It's home security without all of that, uh, those, those contracts that were annoying before. You can build the system that's right for your home and have it up and running in minutes. The Ring Alarm Security Kit comes with everything you need to protect your home with 24 seven professional monitoring and it's only $10 a month. And that includes the base station that keeps your alarm system online and connected to mobile devices. The keypad arms and disarms your alarm system. The contact sensor that lets you know when doors or windows are open. The motion detector, it detects motion inside your home and range extender that extends the signal from your base station. And I, we showed the, the ring alarm in our episode about security and uh, it, it, they're really great products, like all of ring products. They're, they're nice, they have a really loud alarm for you and it's just super easy to set up and it's a smarter way to protect your entire home. The Ring Alarm Security Kit is available at ring.com and you can just walk right into a store uh, anywhere in the U.S. and buy it because it's there too. You've probably seen them and wondered and I'm telling you that it is worth the purchase. And if you want to help out our podcast, you can go to ring.com slash knowhow and then you can learn how to get the whole home security kit for only $10 per month. You get whole home security. That's for your whole home. No long-term contracts. You're not signing away anything. It's only $10 a month. So do that. Go to ring.com slash know-how and then have one system that's protecting you from everyone and everything, including your daughter who was just going to have a couple friends over. Mom, not that many, but then, you know, they can see me. So uh, we thank Ring for their support of know-how. Well, Stacey talked about sensors. We've been trying out some sensors. Hold on, I'm feeling a little depressed <laughs> after that Buck conversation. Buck up, camper. I know, I know. It's just, we're trying to talk about fragmentation today and... <sighs> you just have to, I think, be zen about it and just accept, uh, accept that you're gonna have all the devices 
They're going to work some. We're going to be first, though. We're the first ones on it. Yeah, we yeah. are. We're mm -hmm. setting the trend. Mm -hmm. All right, let's set the trends with some more accessories, okay, actually. Okay, so you tried out the kangaroo I motion did. sensor. I did. Look what I brought. I brought some things. This is the kangaroo motion sensor. This is the kangaroo motion sensor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the thing about this motion sensor is it is, so we were talking about standards and how you have to like have a hub to connect sensors and some bulbs and how annoying that is. You don't need that with this. This is all just completely on its own, hooks up uh, via Bluetooth, I believe. And let me explain to you how this works because it's a little different than your typical motion sensor. So Kangaroo really, from what I'm understanding, the brand is heykangaroo.com. So from what I'm really understanding, this brand wants to be like the easy, you buy the device, it's only 30 bucks, it's like low, low barrier to entry. You buy the device, you literally just pair it to your phone and stick it on the wall and boom, you've got a uh, professional monitoring right there. And uh, the kangaroo, so I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually put this down here. So if, um, actually, if you would like to be my hand model. Oh, I would love to be your hand uh, model. While I explain this. So kangaroo, if you go to heykangaroo.com, they have pricing. So you can pay, Yearly or monthly? Monthly, a dollar a month for self-monitoring, which includes like push notifications and a really easy button to connect you to 911. Or you can get pro monitoring for $9 a month, which is like super cheap compared to some of the other big kahuna systems out there. And that includes 24 seven pro monitoring, which I haven't tried yet because remember I have had quite an experience with these things <laughs> in the past. Uh, so I'm kind of waiting to get a hang of it before we go into there. but. So what I have here is the app. I'm gonna get the app over here and let me turn down the brightness so that we do not blow it out on the screen. We're gonna put it over here. Over there. We're gonna put it over here. We're gonna put it like this. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, so this is the app, as you can see here, there are three buttons on the bottom. So this is the main home screen. You can slide, eh. you can slide to arm it. Um, and when it's armed, you will actually get a phone call if it, or a text message if it detects motion in addition to a push notification. Mm -hmm. And so actually the interesting thing about this, which I should have let off with, but I didn't and I apologize, is that you sign up for this with your phone number. So it's like signing up for WhatsApp or Google Allo, except you're not getting a messaging service, you're getting home security. And let me tell you, the minute I sign up for an account, I did not register these devices quickly because my Pixel 2 has problems connecting. I just have problems setting up IoT with that version of Android for whatever reason, which is why I was using the Samsung phone. So okay, I hopped on there. I didn't get anything set up. I decided to put down. I got a phone call like an hour later from an 888 number, so a toll-free number. And it was Kangaroo calling me, their customer service, asking if I had any problems setting things up. So I was like, you know what? This is part of the experience. I'll I won't just, you know, angrily hang up on them because I don't like talking to people. So <laughs> I decided to stay on the line and go, okay, well let me tell you, it wasn't working with my Pixel. So the the fellow on the other end gave me a couple of ideas. He told me how to hard reset it. So I did hold down the, there's a button on the side actually, Alex, very quickly, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I can show you there's a button right here, very teeny tiny little hole. You would stick a pin or an earring in there or a, a SIM key and push it down for 10 seconds to reset it. And so I did that with my Chromebook. So I ended up uh, pairing it with my Chromebook for a second. He called back. <laughs> He said he'd call me back in 15 minutes, he did. And uh, he was just on the phone with me making sure that I got the product hooked up. So they really wanna be like the easy to set up, we're here for you. So Alex, if you don't mind very quickly going just over the headshot, when you click on this button over here, you will get instant access, they'll call you. So you can just, oh, my phone number's on there, we'll blow that out, don't call me please. Uh, <laughs> That's my bad. Uh, message support team or visit AFQ, AFQ, FAQ. Uh, and then you've got some easy settings, but I haven't set up professional monitoring yet. So I can't speak to that just yet, but. That's pretty good. I mean, 30 bucks, a dollar a month or $12 a year if you want to self monitor and they'll call you if you have problems. I love it. Okay, you want to see my sensor? Yes, I do. Yes, I All do. Right, my sensor uh, is for those of us who've just given up and decided you're all in uh, on the Apple, uh, in Apple, because uh, it's by Eve, which is only works with on iOS, doesn't work on any other huh? platforms. 
Eve, Eve, Elgato Eve. It oh, work. yes, 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 Elgato. And they used to make a lot of accessories for Apple users back. Yeah. Yeah. The so yeah, they used 2000. to, yes, yeah. exactly. They make, they still do make like, you know, stains Docks and, and stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they also make a whole suite of. Okay. So it's IoT called tools. Eve. Eve. Okay. Yes. And it's your Eve Home. And so you do have the Eve Home app, but it also works with HomeKit. So you can do both. But that is a little bit confusing, like as Stacey said, because there are things like on this motion sensor, you can adjust the sensitivity so it's see more or less sensitive and then um, but you can't do that in HomeKit you have to go to the Eve app so it's it, it's fragmentation very frustration so, this is just a motion sensor <laughs> that you can um, get an alert like I get alerts on text messages that's the same messages. with the kangaroo yeah. Yeah. yeah I get HomeKit alerts on text messages on my watch or my phone if someone is moving around and you can set it to just if they're moving around well that's kind of date. I mean that's nice. You could put it like in an area maybe mm -hmm. where Gilbert shouldn't be and find yeah. out if Gilbert's sniffing around where he shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I did that with the cat. And it's a great uh, it's great for people who don't like cameras in their homes either. Yes. Um, if you just want to know if someone's home when they shouldn't be or mm -hmm. someone is in your house when they shouldn't be. Um, so you can also set it to do fun things. So um, HomeKit has automation. So you could set it right. to like, oh, well, when someone comes in, it's going to turn the light uh, purple or nice. something like that. Or, you know, a, a practical things too. It turns the light on when you come in. Uh, you know, we have, you have, many people have, we have that in our home in regular lights, not in our smart home lights. So let me show you what it looks like in HomeKit. Where, there, is that right, the right way? Again, the there interface, every time I see HomeKit, I'm like, that's, it's just so nice. It you have that nice so, background. No. Um, sorry, Google Home app, but. So uh, I'm, I have, I can set it to, let's see the automation that I have. The motion detected in Twit. Um, I'm it's, turn on the brightness just a smidgen for, for our current audience. There we go. Um, so, how's that? Perfect. Then we uh, can, I get, let's set an automation. Here's how you do it. So, I can uh, set an automation with a sense, when a sensor mm. detects something. So, I could do people arrive, people leave, time of day. This is just all HomeKit, but when a sensor detects something. So, then I have one sensor connected That's in HomeKit, easy. and then I just do that, and then I hit next. And then uh, when it detects motion or when it stops detecting motion, I can do, let's say when it detects motion, and then I can set it to do all these things. So these are all the scenes that I have with our nano leaf that we showed last week. So Inner if I piece and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So if I want to have my nano leaf crazy lights go on, I could do that. Um, if I wanted to Romantic. control, if I wanted to, when someone passes, then the front door unlocks. So if I wanted to invite everybody over to my house, all you guys watching this, I could just set this sensor, and then uh, when someone passes by the sensor, the door unlocks. Yeah, the front door would unlock, and then you guys could come over. But I'm not going to do that. Um, so I'm going to do Twit uh, John, the, the light that is John that we have here, and I'm going to have it turn off. Um, so now uh, it's let's look at have it turn on. So I'm going to test this automation. So here, this is the light. So let's, it's a nice day for a live demo, isn't it? Test it's this nice automation. Day for <gasps> and it turned on. It's because you sang Billy Idol. It is. So ideally then when, um, if I t turn that. Oh, I kind of like us with this blue light. It is actually. nice. We look nice. So I hit <laughs> done and then it saves that. And um, let me, then let me turn it off. I could say. Turn off. You wouldn't like it. <laughs> Whoa. Turn off, John. Okay, the John is off. <laughs> the John is off. And then, I hopefully, laugh. when I, um, it's clearly not working because it would have um, the. It has is the Wi-Fi situation or? It's a, yeah. So okay. then, let's pretend when it, it works, works. Then it would go on magically. Turn on John. Turn on John. Okay, the John is on. <laughs> and it works. So if I, let's, um, as long as we are here, we'll try to little do a little troubleshooting why this isn't working. Um, besides just that this, the connected home is not ready. Let's see. Um, Eve motion. It says it's here. The sensitivity is high. The duration is two minutes. Oh, LED on motion. Then I think, see, this is what I'm talking about. This is the Eve app, not the HomeKit app. 
There we go. Um, and I think, let's just say it's going to turn on in five seconds. So, let's see if it turns on. <gasps> it worked! <laughs> Hallelujah! All right. Hallelujah! Now that that worked, I think uh, I'm not going to try to make anything else no, work. No, no. Um, I, I think we've reached is, the end. This, yeah, we have. <laughs> let's stop it here while we still have have something. Two more weeks left. Two we more have weeks. only two more weeks of uh, IoT. IoT magic. Um, so subscribe to get your two more weeks. And then if you're subscribed, then you'll get Jason who's coming after with his own uh, secret 12 weeks of know-how on something different than uh, IoT. So subscribe now, twit.tv slash KH. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, know-how, not Kingdom Hearts. You can watch live uh, 11 a.m. Thursdays, 11 a.m. Pacific Thursdays at twit.tv yep. slash live. You can join us in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. You can join our Google Plus group. Mm -hmm. um, just search know-how for the Google Plus group. I'm always approving people, so I know there's a lot of people, um, and a lot of people asking questions about what we're doing, yeah. and also asking questions about what has been done for the many years in past. And if you want to uh, find out question, you know, answers to your questions about you know, turning a Raspberry Pi into... Um, An uh, actual pie. <laughs> into baking a pie with a Raspberry Pi, go to the Google Plus, uh, find the Kitas, the know-it-alls, um, the, and they will answer those questions mm -hmm. for you. But mm -hmm. I'm Megan Maroney on Twitter. And I'm, oh, that flow on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week on Know How. Until next week.